Hello everyone, welcome to Cracking Addiction. My name is Dr. Fergal Armstrong and we have with us Dr. Laura Petracek. Laura, I thought we'd start today thinking about the 12 steps and the first step out of those 12 steps. What is it? How would you explain it? Well, the first step as written is we admitted we were powerless over alcohol and that our lives have become unmanageable. So there's two main steps in that first step. The first concept mm -hmm. is powerlessness, mm -hmm. and the second concept is unmanageability. So the first concept is powerlessness. Right. And so for myself, I work with the client. I ask them to either talk about it in session or for a homework assignment, write down all the examples of where their life is um, powerless because of alcohol use. So I drank, you know, I went to a wedding, I planned on drinking two drinks, I had 10. That's an example of powerlessness. There, there's just no way that I can say no or that I can control my, my consumption of substances, be it alcohol or some other substance. And that's a, that's a, um, I actually think that the idea that, that I am in control of my substance use is actually a cognitive distortion. I see a number of patients and, uh, who say to me, usually during the first couple of meetings that I have with them, and I say, to them, well, what, what do you think you want to do? What's your treatment goal? Do you want to try and control your drinking or do you want to achieve abstinence? And, and a lot of them say, oh, yeah, I want, to, I want to try and control my drinking. And I think to myself, you're here because so many things have happened in your life that demonstrate that you cannot control your drinking, but you're not yet ready to embrace the idea of abstinence. And therefore, you think you can control your drinking to some extent. And I see that as a cognitive distortion that I need over time to correct with them. I like and the idea for me of being powerless in, in, in front of, in the face of addiction is a very powerful tool that allows me to help people move towards this idea that it's better to do that it's better to try and be abstinent. What do you think about that? I haven't heard it framed that way, but I like using the term cognitive distortion because it is. You know, people who think they can control their drinking when all the evidence is to the contrary. Um, and I also yeah. think, though, that's where I would use motivational interviewing because it's very rare that someone who has a problem is going to come in and say, oh, yeah, I'll go for the uh, abstinent route. Sure, sign me up. No, they're, yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. going to go for the how to control yeah. it. And they will tell you every type of, uh, you know, equation, you know, like drink on an, don't drink on an empty stomach, don't drink hard liquor, don't start till after six, you know, you name it. People have a drinking problem have yeah, done it. Yeah. So, but that's a good uh, frame. I like that because it is a cognitive distortion thinking, you know, and evidence to the contrary, they can't control it. I once had a patient who said to me that he, he would only drink light beer and therefore he didn't have a drinking problem, but he used to drink about eight cans, eight, eight light beers a day rather than three or four light beers or, or, or normal strength beers. And he didn't think that was hazardous at all. Oh, I know. I mean, you know, or I drink... Or this is interesting. This, I didn't even actually become as aware until I worked in the field longer, even though I'm in recovery myself. But people would say, oh, I don't drink. And what they really mean is, well, I have a beer, you know, on Saturday, a couple glasses on wine on a Wednesday. But to them, that's not drinking. And that kind of floored me at first. Yes. But so our society, drinking yeah. means like drinking every night or really getting hammered on the weekend. So I'm like, or people say, oh, I don't drink when I go through this questionnaire. And then I start asking more details. I'm like, well, what do you exactly do you mean you don't drink? Because it has a different meaning for a yeah. lot of people. 
And for most people, that means, yeah, they do drink, <laughs> but just small amounts as far as yeah. they are concerned. So that, that, that's another cognitive distortion. Yes, it, it is. That's a, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Yep. So how do you, if, you've, if you confront someone, so the confront's the wrong word, if you meet a patient who, who's not yet ready to acknowledge the need for abstinence and not yet ready to um, acknowledge that they are powerless in the face of their substance, how do you move them to that to that point of acknowledgement? And you use the word motivational interview right. in there. Does that play a significant role? I think it plays a significant role. I think it is one of the more helpful tools, I should say. I mean, there's a lot of intervention strategies, mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. find that in motivational interviewing uh, is one of the uh, better strategies in terms of getting the client to look at their denial, to look at, you know, where they are compared to where they want to be, um, to look at their mm. understanding of their drinking or drug use. So, um, and mm. it's also, uh, when presented to a client, they seem to, clients are less defensive about it when you use motivational interviewing, whereas, you know, back in the old day, it was more confrontational, and that tends to have the opposite effect on clients and pushes them away. Like, you were in a car accident, yeah, and does, you ended yeah. up with a DUI, so you're alcoholic. That's not going to really, you know, kind of clobbering yeah, someone yeah. over the head is not going to help. Yeah, it doesn't, no. does it? Um, yeah. And, that, and you're right, that was... <laughs> <laughs> that was a way that was that I was certainly taught you know, that you one one has to uh, confront the patient with the truth and the discrepancy between the objective truth and their truth. Exactly. But when I worked at San Quentin State Prison uh, in the intake department, um, I don't know. I just kind of thought this up one day, and I'd go through their drinking history, and I'd I say, you know. I think there's a problem because when you drink, you break out in handcuffs and they just start laughing. <laughs> but, it also, but it got them kind of relaxed more and listening. Like, hey, if you weren't drinking, you wouldn't yeah. break out in handcuffs, you know, instead of like if you use this medication, yeah. you break out in hives. So I'd say you're allergic to alcohol. Yeah. And then we'd kind of get the ball rolling there. But when I was more formal and kind of going through the benchmark questions, not a lot was really, uh, there wasn't much of a dialogue. Yeah. Um, so I think also to approach yeah. someone in a more relaxed manner, but yet they're still getting the point. Like, you know, if you break yeah. out in handcuffs, there's a problem. <laughs> one, of the, one of the issues that um, I used to have which was a barrier to my accepting the value of motivational interviewing was I used to feel that I was responsible for my patient's behavioral change. And therefore, it, you know, it tends to be that, you know, if you're responsible for making someone else's behavior change, then you've got to make sure that they truly understand what's going on. And, you know, this is the reality of the situation and it must change. Whereas with motivational interviewing, you can meet the patient wherever they are. And if they're, in a situation where they're in a mindset which tries to minimize their alcohol, that's okay, you know, because you're not responsible for their change. Right. You don't, um, you're not responsible and it's like you're not in that mode to try to fix it. Exactly. You don't have like to fix it. I remember a exactly. supervisor saying, if I'm working harder than the client, then I'm, working too hard then i'm trying to yes. be in that fix it mode and having yes. them quote stop or see the errors of their way in drinking yeah. Yeah. um but the motivational yeah. interview yeah you can kind of sit back a minute or a little bit and not try to you know uh fix it for them whereas yeah, before absolutely. i would have more of a determined effort and i think it 
Yeah. You know, even though I'm in recovery myself, I would use that as a way to try to convince them. And it was mm. just way too much work and not much of a re, um, response on their part. There's not much return on investment for that one. Is yeah, there? exactly. That's it. My, not much return on investment. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So... I mean, you know, we, we would both agree then that motivational interviewing really is ideal for helping people accept ultimately the powerlessness of <clears throat> of, of their own powerlessness in the face of a, on the face of a substance use. Is there any other way of looking at powerlessness to to achieve enlightenment in this issue? Well, sometimes I have them look at other areas of their life that they're powerless. I mean, there's also a saying, you know, I'm powerless over people, places, and things. And actually, mm. in most of our life, we're powerless. But for the person who's an alcoholic, they tend to just focus on, you know, I'm not powerless over alcohol, or they struggle with that. But I'm like, okay, well, let's look at, you know, your boss. Uh, you say you hate your boss. He dumps extra work on you. Would you say you're powerless over him? Oh, yeah. Or let's look at your teenage kid who, you know, comes home whenever he wants. Do you feel powerless over him? Yes. Or let's look at, you know, the wildfire fires that were raging, you know, ravaging Australia. Were you powerless over that? Yeah. So mm. then I try to bring those other issues in to say, well, alcohol is similar to those other examples. Yeah. You're powerless. Yeah. Look at. Look at all the data. Mm. You know, your whole chart is says you're powerless. I, I listened to a podcast done by Andrew Huberman, the Huberman Lab podcast. Um, and he talks about the only thing you can truly control is your attention and your effort. Yeah. You could, we could only control our response to the situation. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. That's that's perfect. You we can, yes, that, that goes back to that uh, that um, uh, Victor Frankl idea. Yeah, you know, I was between, just going to say between, Victor Frankl. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, can only, only you can only truly control your response. Hours. Yeah. And, and that um, that response is about your attention and your effort, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. So how do we, how do we, knowing that, how do we put that into the lens of uh, helping someone with an alcohol use disorder or, or substance use disorder? Well, I usually, so people usually come to me on an outpatient basis, an, basis initially. And um, so at first I'll say, okay, let's try it your way. So for the next week or two weeks, I'll have them keep a journal how much they drank, or first, what were you feeling before you picked up the drink? How much did you drink? How much did you, what did you feel afterwards? And so we'll go over like a couple of weeks of that. And then I'll say, okay, now I want you to not drink this next week and write down, you know, how you felt the day you wanted to drink. What was the urge like on a scale of one to 10? And, um, Basically, the exercise is to show them they can't really do it on their own because they usually yeah. fail. And yeah. then I say, okay, now, and, and this is in the beginning, I'll say, if your way doesn't work, then would you be willing to try my way? Okay, but my way is going to work, so don't worry about it, Doc. All right. Um, and so then I usually uh, up the level of care to outpatient treatment. And if that doesn't work, then up the level of care to inpatient. So I let it seem yeah. like they're kind of driving the decisions, they're driving the boat. And in a way, they are. Um, but yeah. most people do not want to start with abstinence. It's unless, like, you know, they're just absolutely done. Um, so, yeah. like you were saying earlier, meet them where they are. Okay, well, you're at a place of you know, help me manage my drinking better so I could go on living my life as I see fit, you know. Um, is that possible? 
Have you ever helped someone manage their drinking so they can keep their keep on going as they see fit? I have seen. There are a few people I've seen in AA that, like, I had a friend who was in AA probably ten years, and she said, "AA," she said, "Laura, I'm afraid to tell you this, but I need to be honest. Um, I do not go to AA anymore. I don't think I'm an alcoholic, and I've started drinking again." And I feel like I'm a quote, you know, normal or regular drink drinker. And then subsequently in the past two years, I mean, at least on the outside, you know, things look like her relationship seems okay, her job. So I don't know, maybe she really was an alcoholic. Um, and I've seen, I, I've known a few people like that, like, you know, and even some people have told me, oh, you quit drinking when you're 17. You can't be an alcoholic then. And sometimes it tweaks my mind like, oh, maybe not. But, you know, I I have alcohol. My whole family is pickled at alcoholism. So I don't want to give it a try. But yeah. I've seen other people who have done OK. Now, I've seen plenty of others who haven't. <clears throat> Yeah. But I don't necessarily believe in that if you have a drink, you're going to die or, you know, uh, yeah. I, I don't go for that hardcore. I don't think it's really helpful. I mean, I, I, mean I, I don't really see that many people who are truly able to control their drinking. By the time patients get referred to me, they, they're, usually, they're, they're usually dependent on alcohol. You know, there's no... There's no two ways about it. So I spent a lot of my time helping them come to that realization. But something else you said that triggered me is a lot of my clients haven't yet reached rock bottom, even though they know they've got dependency. They haven't reached rock bottom. And the, I th yeah. the, the part of my role, I think, is is trying to get them to the realization that they are truly powerless and they do need to use abs or get to the point of seeing abstinence as a goal of treatment before things get worse in their life. I think that is, it is challenging, you know, mm. and the first step in AA talks about a lot of people will only seek help when they hit rock bottom. But then they yeah. also say in the subsequent additions, we've seen people you know, that are younger to try to get sober, even if they haven't, you know, hit rock bottom. Um, yeah. So I guess it also means, you know, how you're defining rock bottom. Like there are, let's say, people who have the job, have the relationship. But um, like I worked with a, uh, a man that is in tech and is really high up in the food chain and uh, on in Facebook. Um, you know, he has a beautiful wife, three kids, you know, a gazillionaire. And uh, from all ends of his life, he, you know, like, what's the problem? Except his wife said, there's a problem. So if it wasn't for her, he wouldn't be coming in for treatment. But Mm. Um, you know, from all the other, like, he's got to look good, you know, and, uh, mm. but until she kind of put her foot down, he said he wouldn't have come in for treatment. Um, now this, I think would be a good conversation for another discussion, but something that I'm working with him on that I have not done with another client, but this was a way to kind of get him on board, so to speak, was he goes, okay, Laura, I'm going to quit alcohol. I'm going to go to meetings, but I'd like a compromise. I'm like, well, what do you mean? Like drink on the weekend? He goes, no, no, no. I know alcohol is a big problem, even though I won't tell anyone except you and my wife. But he goes, I'd like to try to be able to use CBD once in a while. You know, that marijuana oil, so I have a vague kind of familiarity with it. <laughs> okay. So he's using it like once a week, but you know what? I, he's doing okay. So I feel like we've reached a good compromise. Whereas if yeah. you would have asked me that 10 years ago, I would have said, oh no, you're not totally abstinent. So 
you'll have to find yourself yeah. another psychologist. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a, a that's a, a talk a series in itself. The, the role of both yes. THC and CBD in, in uh, substances. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make the point when I was listening to you and also reflecting uh, on what you said before. For me, for me, that point of rock bottom is when people do realize that they are powerless. You know, in every story of recovery, there's, you know, if you talk to people who are, who are in recovery, they can always remember the time when they finally said enough is enough. The problem is, is that we don't know as, as therapists whether or not the person in front of us has actually reached that inflection point. But you can only diagnose it retrospectively. Well, okay, so that, that's an interesting point because... Like for this man, his wife said enough is enough. Mm. You know, going back to the codependent discussion a little bit earlier offline, um, because he doesn't think that. And I know in the literature or even in the rooms of AA, they say if you, like you could come into the rooms for someone else, but if you don't stay for you, it's not going to work. If you yourself don't, you know, admit that, hey, I have yeah. a problem. So, uh, I mean, that's a good point. If people don't hit that bottom, um, uh, I don't know. It's, it's, um, you're not convinced by that. I'm not totally convinced because sometimes <laughs> it's their other people in their life where they've said enough's enough. You get help or I'm out of here. Or for me, it was actually more my mental health that I said enough is enough. But I've also, I'll just, you know, end with this. I remember I did some work uh, as a psychologist in a nursing home or nursing homes. And they took me to this one floor and I thought, well, these people look so young. What are they doing in a nursing home? And they said, oh, this is the alcoholism ward. These are all the people who didn't think they had a problem. This is where they ended up. And I was totally shocked. You know, like people, someone who jumped out a window or someone who, uh, I forget the phrase now, but where you drink and your brain just. Uh, of course, of course. that goes through the Korsakoff psychosis. Yeah, Korsakoff, yeah. yeah. Otherwise known as. Um, yeah, alcohol related dementia. Yes. Yeah. And uh that just was like a wow. I, I mm. just was kind of shocked actually. I mean, I've read a lot yeah. about it, but I've never Yeah, and these were people like in their thirties, you know. Yeah. Just really yeah. sad. So yeah, it's very sad. Disease, I tell people it's no joke. That's for sure. So We've, we've run out of time, Laura, unfortunately, yet again. I want to thank you for your pearls of wisdom, and I want to celebrate our first point of difference. And I really hope that we can uh, resume this discussion again soon. Thank you very much, Laura. Yeah, thank you, Fergal. That's all for today, folks. My name is Dr. Fergal Armstrong, and this has been Cracking Addiction.